Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 176th episode of The Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, David Dawson, and I am so stoked to bring you tonight's episode. This is our uncut interview slash chat conversation with actor Nathan Darrow from Gotham and House of Cards. You may know him from Gotham as Mr. Freeze. You may know him from House of Cards as Meacham. And, well, I know him as Whitney's friend, Nathan. And we had the opportunity to sit down with Nathan when I did my East Coast tour a a month and a half ago, two months ago. Um, Whitney flew out for uh, for the conversation with Nathan. We also videotaped it. Uh, The edited version of this conversation makes up our very first ever The Intellectual Talk Show, which debuted tonight on KSDY Channel 50.2 over the air in San Diego and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash intellectual network. So if you want to watch the interview with Nathan, uh, you have that opportunity. Uh, Just visit our our YouTube channel to to check it out. And... um, if you're joining us because you watched that that uh, episode, thank you so much for watching the show. Uh, welcome to the podcast. You'll get about 25 minutes more content in this um, in this version of the of the discussion. Uh, it's completely unedited, so it's it's totally raw, and um, it's a good conversation. We had a really great time with Nathan, and he was so gracious in making the time for us and uh, sitting down uh, for the for the talk show and for the podcast, and I can't wait for you to dive into it and hear more of it, and if you aren't already subscribed to us on YouTube, please subscribe to us. We have uh, several more episodes of the Intellectual Talk Show in the can, including our most recent visit with Halo Circus, uh, one of my favorite bands around, um, fronted by Allison Irajeda from American Idol. And uh, they played here in San Diego this past week, and we had a a delightful time sitting down catching up with the band. Um, Lots of stuff going on. This is the big super secret project, the TV version of the podcast, the intellectual talk show. It's finally here. We're going to talk about it as new episodes come. Uh, We will try and have the rest of these first five pilot episodes out um, to you before the year is out. And if things go well, we're hoping to be on a more regular uh, schedule with it uh, in the new year, uh, bringing you many, many exciting new guests. We have a a number of huge things in the works um, that we're hoping to to push forward on, and we're, we're just really, really excited um, to that uh, to that point, um, I, I would like to just take a moment to say uh, advertising opportunities are coming your way. If you're interested in getting on board with intellectual uh, as an advertiser, we have we're going to be selling spots on the podcast as well as on the TV show. Um, your chance to get in now while it's uh, while it's inexpensive, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, give us a ring, send us an email, info at theintellectual.com, and we'll be glad to discuss with you the advertising possibilities. And now, let's uh, dive right into this interview slash conversation, because I hate calling them interviews, with actor Nathan Darrow of Gotham and House of Cards on the 176th episode of The Intellectual Podcast. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The intellectual podcast starts now. Okay, so cool. How do you pronounce your last name? Darrow or Darrow? Darrow. Darrow. Because I I went online and I checked some reviews and stuff of you as Mr. Freeze. And at least half of the people online were calling you Darrow. (laughs) Oh, these are reviews where they're like speaking or yeah uh, yeah like youtube reviews and yeah stuff. no it's it's often i often hear daro um but no it's like if you look at the the name and you see the word arrow is in it there's a d is in front of arrow so, there you go <laughs> so. but i guess there's a thing with names where you always figure there's some weird vowel sound going on with a name yeah some some weird cultural yeah. background to the name what is what is the heritage of daro um the heritage of Darrow, I believe, is Irish. 
uh, or Scottish. Um, and I remember my sister finding out many years back that the meaning was uh, son of the black man of the oak. All right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's what it means. That's not at all what I would have anticipated. No, I definitely would have thought like you guys were archers or nope. something. So, so your dog is pounding around here. So just yep. so it was just so he people is. understand because the cameras can't see him because he's right. below the table. Um, yeah, this your is dog's sunny. sunny hanging That's out. my dog's sunny, and he's uh, trying to murder Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and he has been for a number of weeks. It's one of it's his favorite funny, toys. If I call him up on the chairs, is he allowed? Gosh, I don't know. Oh, I don't. Catch him. I don't know. Hey, Sunny, up, up. He's a beautiful golden retriever. Hey, buddy, mix. up, up. Can you say hi? He's like no. no. It's I like no. Focused. Some violence. I'm busy. Oh, I'm busy I'm destroying. Oh, well, now he wants to play. <laughs> uh, thanks for having us at your home. Sure. Uh, you, you like recently moved in here, right? Uh, yeah, about a year ago. A year ago. Yeah. Um, how did you guys meet? Like, that's probably a good start. Um, go for it. Else? No, go for <laughs> it. Um, we met in Kansas City. Um, we both were working uh, for the Heart of America Shakespeare Festival on a production of Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Nathan was our Romeo. That's right. And you were? I was doing tech. I was backstage. Oh, that was your, your tech time. I built the things, the bed, the bower, I had a lot of stuff, actually. <laughs> yeah. so. uh, what was it like doing Shakespeare in Kansas City? Um... Well, um, it was it was doing Shakespeare, which is always very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was great. I mean, um, Kansas City is where I'm from uh, okay. originally, so um, you know, my path was I, uh, I I left town to go to college, and then went straight to acting school in New York. Uh, and then after only a few years, I, I came back to Kansas City uh, and then ended up working professionally in that community for a number of years. Uh, and it was fantastic. And when it comes to, you know, the Shakespeare Festival, for instance, uh, that production of Romeo and Juliet, um, the actor who played Mercutio was an actor uh, called David Fritz, who when I was like a 16 year old kid in high school, I saw him play Biff Lohman at the, <laughs> at the, then the Missouri Repertory Theater. And it is still a performance that is, you know, imprinted on me as just being, uh, you know, one of the most powerful I've ever been in the company of. Uh, so, you know, working in Kansas City with all of those people was, was uh, was a really awesome thing for me. That's really cool. It's a it's it's fascinating to me how a performance that you see when you're young can really kind of impact you and affect you and kind of ride with you all the way along. Um, I was telling Whitney in our first podcast together about um, how I went to go see Peter Coyote mm. um, in a very first run of Jake's Women, Neil Simon's mm -hmm. play, mm -hmm. at, at the Old Globe in San Diego when I was in the sixth grade. And, you know, here it is 30 years later. <laughs> yeah. And I still, like, can't get that performance out of my head. It's one of the reasons why I became a director. Like, I yeah. wanted to work with actors and do powerful performances like that. How did it feel to be able to work with somebody who was, for you, that kind of young influence? Like, was it intimidating? Uh, um, honestly, by that point, I had been working in the community for a while. Mm -hmm. and I had worked with Dave... I think two years prior in the Shakespeare Festival, and he was he was Benedict in a production of Much Ado About Nothing, where I mm. played Claudio, uh, and that was that was the one where I remember feeling, I don't know that it was intimidated. It was a little bit intimidated. It was a little bit just like you know, I was still in awe, and I was I had also seen him do things even after Death of a Salesman that right. were like, you know, 
when you see an actor, you know. But I think the thing about David is, you know, he's so comforting and open, and I, I think you get over that really fast. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, no, by that point, we had we had hung out, you know, we had had more than a few beers together, so it was, uh, that was great, I mean. You said you came to New York to, to do some uh, acting schools. Where did you, right. where did you um, go? Well, I went to, I went to NYU, uh, to the, to the, the graduate acting program, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, is a, a kind of, you know, a three year, you know, intense conservatory, uh, you know, with the same folks and the same faculty and like a kind of a little class, um, at that time, it was headed by uh, Zelda Fitchhandler, who, uh, rest in peace, just passed away only, uh, maybe only a month ago. Oh. Uh, but she had, uh, she's one of the pioneers of the, you know, regional theater movement in the United States. She founded Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. And so she was, she was in charge of things there. And so she kind of brought that idea of, you know, a company of actors was her, was kind of her guiding vision. So she was trying to train us to be able to be in a company, a, an actual like resident company of actors. Turns out those don't really exist anymore in this country. So we were kind of being trained for a system that was not like, was not even there necessarily to, necessarily to catch us. But Turns out that's still really good acting training, and you know our, you know, uh, producers, directors, writers, you know, still benefit from actors that are, you know, just trained to be, to be versatile, to be able to understand, you know, um, uh, where a particular writer might be coming from, and also trained to kind of take in the whole the whole thing, the whole play, the whole story. Um, yeah, it was a good, it was really good, intense time. I, I, I ran into a lot of, you know, I, I ran into the real thing a lot, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. people who were like, mm, that's, that's it. That's, that's it. I probably was a little young for the experience. I think looking back, you know, I think I was, uh, having gone straight from college, uh, I think I was still in a, a slightly institutional mindset, which is tough when you're trying to learn something that is creative. Right. You, because, you know, I understand. Well, that. education by nature has a certain structure to it. Yes. But once you leave that, you've got to kind of learn to break the structure a little well, and, yeah. and, and well, find, find a little bit of your own path, right? I mean, yes, I would say this. I would say that structure is one thing and structure is probably uh, consistently necessary mm -hmm. for a person who's pursuing something creative. You know, it's the, um, it's, it's the effort to please um, the instructor. Yeah, is like you what, want to try and get the grade as opposed right. to finding what is your path, your... Right, path. right, right. That was my first year of grad school as well. <laughs> it yeah. took me a while to break that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, because as the artist, you have to be guided by a light that only you really know. I mean, only you know what that is. I mean... Maybe somebody more experienced can like sort of shape and respond to, but the kind of real thing, it's, uh, well, it just, it just can get lost in, in the structure in a way. Yeah, right? in academia. Yeah. go quiet, you know. When do you feel like you found that for yourself? Was there a particular production where it was like, okay, this is... This is how I, I do this for me, not for this instructor. Well, You're still finding it for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I you? would like to say that there was, there was one or, I mean, I mean, I, I also don't want to say that, um, that I'm like in recovery from <laughs> training because I'm not, I mean, mostly <laughs> I got like great things from training. It was just, it's just specifically, I often wonder like, well, if I had just more spine and 
and I could have encountered those people and been in that situation, what I could have got from it. But it's all it's all sort of hindsight. I do think that while at the same time it's like all you have, also it's not strange, I don't think, for an artist or a creative person to be afraid of what that light is or to actually, of their own choice, ignore it now and then because it's difficult, Mm -hmm. you know? Then, well, speaking as an actor, you know, when you're guided by the light, then you're going to be, like, really implicated in the circumstances of Romeo and Juliet, you know? Then you're going to, like, really have something on the line as opposed to... um, use kind of pure technique to get through or to make it work or to make it like palatable to an audience, you know, right. there's this, there's this great thing that I got. This is the last couple of years. I got this from, a, this Russian director who, uh, comes over and works with this acting group that I'm, a, that I'm a part of in New York. And, uh, he's, he's fantastic. And, and, uh, he tells this story of uh, this man walks into the circus and says, I, I have an amazing trick to the ringmaster. The ringmaster says, okay, yeah, let me see it. And so the man climbs all the way up to the highest part of the big top, right, on the ladder, and jumps straight down, head first, bam, right on the bottom, right, gets up. And the ringleader says, that's a fantastic trick. Can you do it again? And he says, yeah. But the thing is, it hurts. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's it, right? And and he was and the reason he told us this story was he had he was working at his theater on Waiting for Godot. Mm Mm-hmm. And he and the way he was working on it was he had an old company and a young company. So he was doing it with, you know, a Vladimir and an Estragon who were, you know, maybe 50s. And then he had like the ones that were 20s. And he said, it's so interesting to see them work on it because the ones that are in their 20s, they just barrel right in. They're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's 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 completely go there. Let's do it. Whereas the older actors were more careful. Because, I mean, when you think about what's in that play and when you think right. about, like, what you're headed to, it's like you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't recklessly, like, run to connect to that. <laughs> right? No. Right. It, it, it is interesting as, as we get older um, as creatives because we bring everything of who we are to, to the table. Like, our if you play a character at 20, it's going to be different when you're 30 and you play it differently when you're 40. Like, are you finding as you're maturing a a change to the way you're approaching characters and how you approach the work? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hope so always. Uh, but I would say yes. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly trying to, get rid of uh, what's extraneous. Mm-hmm. And that is that feels like uh, that feels like something that a person also does as they get older. You right. Know? Let go of the baggage. Yeah. Exactly. And and um, you know some of it is uh, some of it is uh, purely physical. You know, it is simply a result of the fact that like there's like less energy in the body. So, you know, you have to become more efficient. Like, you know, older people just have to sort of take care of how they even do things physically. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I hope that it extends to one's understanding of, uh, what there is, what there is, is or isn't or might be to life, you know, uh, you know, you probably, 
you probably start to just want the truth. You probably start to just want like, well, I think, I think maybe as you're getting older and your life experience grows, you're more able to represent the truth as opposed to pretending the truth. So like, like I've, I've lost both my parents now. So when I approach directing a scene where people are mourning or grieving, how I approach directing actors now for that is way different because I'm far more educated personally in the grieving process than yes. 10 years ago before my parents started to, to pass. Um, so I imagine it would be the same with an actor. Like as your own life experience is growing, you're able to come and approach the work more and more from an aspect of your own personal truth as opposed to an abstract truth that you're trying to convey. Yes. Right. If, um, yeah, if, if we say that, um, like good acting has a lower ratio of cliches to, you know, truth in it, cliches of behavior or expression or even understanding, then yeah, I would think that if you are sort of paying attention to your own life, your own inner life, your own physical life, which all are things that can be observed. Just like if you're sitting at the coffee shop and you want to people watch, like we can watch ourselves, you know, <laughs> I mean, right. we could be the first person that we're watching, but, but I would think that the more you do that, then, um, cliches are going to hopeful, hopefully fall away. Mm -hmm. If you start to have, well, you know, at some point you have to have the courage to say that like, Oh, it can just be this. It can like be this simple, but that's like, that's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. I think, especially, uh, when you're, you know, when you're pursuing it professionally, uh, you know, as an actor, there's this, there's this thing of like, you want to do something special. You, know? right. you want to sort of like get noticed or you want to like, how can I, how can I really make this like undeniable and it's like a it's like a devil's bargain, you know, because well, that's fine, but have you have you moved away from have you moved away from like the essence? And mm -hmm. then, you know, what do you got? The best acting is and just what do you being. got? Hey, son. Um <laughs> Yeah. Well, that that's the Yeah, that's what you're I think that's what we're we're aiming for. This is what also takes a lifetime, unfortunately. Well, it's yeah. difficult for people to be present. Even yeah. even people who are non-actors, just being present in the moment you're in, that's really hard to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. Especially on like a film set, because there's yeah. so much distraction between the camera guys and the lighting guys and the sound guys and catering around the corner and <laughs> whatever else. <laughs> like, how do you find that ability to narrow in and just focus on the performance with all of that stuff okay. going on. Well, cause it is, it looks natural to a, to an observer, right. Right. but if anybody's been on a film set, like there's, there's nothing natural about a film set. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, depends on what we call natural, you know? I mean, it's, it's, well, it's all being made by animals. So, like, is it well, I, having, having, you know, 10, one K's, you know, okay. blaring at you yeah, from no, one no. side of the room. The, the answer to your question um, is I would say, according to my standard, I usually don't. I'm usually not successful in that. And then the trick becomes, like, how tolerant of myself am I? <laughs> you know, like, am I going to now compound the problem, the problem, you know, by sort of, uh, I guess you would call it, like, quitting or giving up, you know? There's this kind of inner sense that says okay and along with this along with how i feel i'm doing in the circumstances i'm gonna now act the scene as best i can just kind of acquiesce yeah. to what it well, is <laughs> sure i mean uh i mean that's not to say that i'm not uh on a on a path toward toward really uh, toward learning some something about attention and relaxation because I think that's like what the actor is, is going for mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I've found already, you know, I mean, speaking specifically with House of Cards, I mean, I was very, very green to all that stuff when we started that. And it was like those things were total... I don't know if you would call them, I guess you would call them distractions. I mean, they were, it was just so interesting to me. Like, what is that guy doing? Like, what, he, he knows his job so well. And shit, what's my job? I don't know my job at all. You know, it's, <laughs> it is like, but I've noticed already, you know, that just keep, keep going, keep working at it, keep, you know, back up on the horse, that it's becoming different. And I think that I'm, I feel like I'm headed toward a place where, they're not distractions. Mm -hmm. They're all, they're all, they're all helping. It's all right. helping. Right. Not, not just helping like, oh, that guy's making you look good. It's like helping because it's there. And like, there's a, that's a real human there. Well, they're, stimuli for they're all part of the energy of, of putting it together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the crew on a film set is... I mean, they make so many movies great. I, I, this is a guess that I have. This is like a recent theory I have. Is I think they make so many movies great in addition to their own expertise within their department, which is you know, which is significant. By being uh, sort of honest recipients of the scene, mm -hmm. by actually like attending to the scene, not in a way that. Well, to contrast it with uh, the theater, which uh, you know I'm I'm very involved in and love and and you know always will. There is sometimes though a feeling in a rehearsal room where you have a lot of people that are there that are just like absolutely ready for it to be brilliant, you know, mm -hmm. which is a good thing, but it's also sometimes a bad thing because you're not necessarily feeling that. Whereas crew on a film set sometimes just giving you such an honest response that for an actor that is gold man mm -hmm. I had a quick question because you brought up House of Cards and you were mentioning earlier that you were kind of intimidated when you worked with David Fritz how did you feel yeah. the first time you had to do a scene with Kevin Spacey oh well um, the first time I had to do a scene with Kevin Spacey was not on House of Cards it was uh, in this play that we did it was a production of Richard III that went around oh. the world oh really yeah, yeah. That, this is what like led to me being on House of Cards so I had worked with him already um, now I hadn't worked with him on a movie so it was different you know right. that's different there was a different kind of attention and concentration and also it was an area in which you know, he had me way trumped in experience. Not to say he doesn't have me trumped in experience on stage. He he does, but it's but it's less so. I was more. I was a little bit more. You that know, that was experience. your element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you were okay there. Yeah, but um, no, all of that just added to it. I mean, it's somebody that I um, that I that I respect so much. Um, you know, his work. Now, by that time, I also knew him as a person. You know, we were friends. So it was like I felt that I had, uh, you know, I had support in that way. So doing the scene was was like, you know, it was good. It was like, no, this is, uh, this is a guy who's, uh, you know, you know, I know, I know he cares about me. I know that he understands, like, where I'm coming from as an actor and like where I want to, you know, how I want to develop. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah. Make sure he's not on this cord. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, ooh, new chew toy. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that, that you did a stage yeah. play with him. Yeah, yeah. So I killed him in that play. And you saved him in House of Cards. I, that's exactly right. <laughs> full circle. That weird? Full, yeah. Did you know going into House of Cards that that was going to be the fate of your character? No. No, I didn't. How, how did it feel to get that script? <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't a script. It was. Uh, I got a phone call from uh, Bo Willem on the creator. Mm -hmm. um, a, you know, f maybe a few months before we started working on the fourth season that was, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And then he just told me that that was how it was going to be. I mean, by that point, I was, you know, I was anticipating myself just like, well, where's, where are we going with this, you know? And that was certainly one of the scenarios that was in my mind. Mm-hmm. And, and it was one that was appealing to me. Because it I was thought, beautiful. Oh, I cried. Oh, oh thank my. you. I cried. It was so sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did such a great job. Though. Gosh, thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, I, I, you know, the way I thought about the guy, the character, it just, it it made total sense, you know, Mm -hmm. it made total sense that that was, you know, this guy has had a war experience, an intense one. So there's no, there's kind of no meaning in life anymore if you can't like die for somebody, I think. I think that was his thing, you know. Um, I don't know that he knew that that was exactly what he was about or what was his thing. Uh, because actually I think that he, he, he didn't necessarily want to die for somebody, but he, he, he needed that level of devotion and closeness, you know, to, uh, to kind of be okay, to be even, um, mm-hmm. my only problem with the end was that, uh, was that he got hit at all. You know, <laughs> if I was writing it, he would, uh, he would have been totally unscathed because, you know? <laughs> because he's a superhero and yeah. then you jump to be no, the superhero. No, I would be dead and Francis would be totally uh, not hit. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. 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 So it was a, a flawed success. Hey. <laughs> um, how did you come to find yourself on Gotham? Right. Um, well, I just I just auditioned for that part. Um Yeah. Uh and I remember it was in this house actually that I'd gotten the the script and it was gonna be like the next day or something. I mean it was a quick kind of turnover, I had to kinda of work on it. And I, I went up to this room upstairs and we had nothing in this house and I just kinda of, you know, was there myself with it and I just loved the uh I loved the writing. I loved how it was, you know, unpacked and, and I just found that it was really interesting. So, you know, when that happens, you, you often feel like, well, I I think I have a better chance of getting this than when I'm like, Oh, what is this? What do I do with this? You know? (laughs) So, so I just prepared pretty hard. And I remember I went in the next day and I just felt good about what happened and they hired me for the job. How did you approach the character? Um, cause I mean, I think most people's experience with Mr. Freeze is unfortunately the Joel Schumacher mm-hmm. tragedy <laughs> with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Harsh. Um, well, <laughs> you know, be honest. <laughs> um, but Gotham is such a wildly darker and right. semi more realistic take on everything than, than what we were presented with back then in the nineties. Yeah. Um, what was the truth of the character for you? Right. How, how, did, how did you well, how did you come to to feel what yeah. Victor is going through? Right. Um, um, one thing I remember it was it very much felt felt to me like a person who uh, needs to take care of things. Like he sort of needs to have things organized and properly understood, uh, and also seen to, you Mm -hmm. know, um, and this is actually before I started to understand in some of the backstories about him, the, the relationship with Nora. Um, so like that was kind of the first thing. The first thing was, was how interesting it was to be a guy who is used to having things like under his control and that, here's one that here's one that ain't and and he's kind of so unwilling to see it you know mm-hmm. just felt you know felt very human um and that was it initially and then and then we we started working on it uh and then it started to feel you know more uh more kind of personal and tender when when I was working with uh 
the actor uh, Kristen Hager who played Nora, you know, just kind of started to feel like, oh yeah, this is, this is, she's all he's got, you know. Um, yeah, it was really fun. That's an interesting point too, because when when you're reading a script, you have the one interpretation, which is your own, but then inevitably you have to perform with somebody in these scenes. How, how much do you enjoy that process of kind of rediscovering even the scene once you start getting to work with the other actors? Um, I think I'm enjoying it more and more. I'm, I mean, I think I, I spent a long period, um, maybe, yeah, well, I don't know why, but, but, um, sort of focusing a lot on just what I was doing you know, and mm-hmm. kind of needing that to needing to understand all of that. And I think that it kept me from taking in, you know, the other, the other element. And, and I think, uh, until I started to let go of some of that, uh, I couldn't really let the, what the other actor was doing in. And I think I, I, I sort of did a lot of kind of complaining to myself about like, Oh, they're doing this. It makes it hard. Blah. What, you know? Um, but you know, when you're working on a character, I think like, I mean, all you're doing is you're trying to get things loose. You're actually just trying to get like air in there so that it can, so that it can be. And then, you know, you do learn a lot from the other actor. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you know. Well, it's like you've got to make choices for yourself as to who your character is. They have to make choices for themselves as to who the characters are. And then together, like you have to find a oh, yeah. joint decision on how these characters yeah, work and that's, together. And it's not a decision like we're going to have a meeting and make a decision. It's, right. uh, it's, it's, a it's decision an organic, fluid. Totally, yeah, in the air. And, and, you know, married people or people that are, have a deep relationship, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, probably you'd say this about people. You'd say, well, you want to know him? Like, get to know his wife. Or you want to know her? <laughs> get to know him. I mean. In regards to that organic finding things with your your scene partner, how easy or, or difficult do you find it whenever people come from a way different technique school than you do as far as your acting technique? Or have you found that? Like method versus... Meisner versus yeah right. Um, I don't. I don't the eyes know. went up into the top <laughs> of his head. Did you see that? Uh. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, I've. Uh, I mean, I've never felt that I had a kind of a technique, like like a technique, like a, like I know that I'm a Meisner trained actor, or I'm a. Sort of an amalgam. Trained actor. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you're. I'm always judging how successful it is, kind of based on the percentage, uh, the percentage of aliveness I feel in it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the, the kind of when you know that well, this is just kind of happening, or this is just kind of. Not to say that I want to like forget myself necessarily because that's that's not necessarily the case, but it is sometimes like you get a you get like a pinch where you're like, oh that's you know that's interesting that's instructive you know that's like closer, um, and you know whatever technique a person comes from like. Uh, they're, uh, man, they're existing at the same time you are. Like that's, that's often enough if you, uh, if you can like let it be. Um, but again, I haven't necessarily had like a really weird, tough experience where somebody has been, you know, doing weird things. or <laughs> Nobody's sending you weird dead rats or anything. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, I just read this thing recently about all the chaos from Suicide Squad. Yeah. So it yeah. made me think of it. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, uh, kind of the proof is in the pudding. Actually, this comes from uh, this comes from 
spacey. This is the this is like a third hand story, I guess. But he was really close with Jack Lemon, mm-hmm. and uh, he told me that Jack told him that on the set of Some Like It Hot, you know, it took forever for Marilyn Monroe to get out of her trailer because right. she had you know Lee Strasberg or Lee Strasberg's wife. I mean, she was heavily into what you'd call method actually that's as method as gets like the american method of the 60s or whatever he's like it just took forever and we were waiting blah 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 he said but when she came out it was all it was all there yeah it was all good so he was like take as much time as you need you know proof is in the pudding i mean if if it works for that actor yeah i mean look at i think yeah, mailing somebody a dead rat or, you know, doing doing something like aggressive, like intentionally kind of hurting some or, or provoking somebody emotionally or physically is, is not maybe my thing. But but so you didn't I, play the Joker. That's so. true. I guess. Am I saying that? Some would argue neither did Jared, but. <laughs> Harsh. I don't know. I don't know. Am I, am I saying that if it works as a result of that, that it's not worth it? It's an interesting like question. Maybe I am saying that, but maybe I am saying that because you it's know, like a very Buddhist approach to acting. It's you do whatever as long as it doesn't harm anyone. I think so. I mean, I mean, or well, oh, this is such a this is a big topic, and this is an interesting question because, uh, a lot of actors want to feel it, like they want to feel. You know, not feel everything, but they want to feel something. They want to right. feel like get. They want to get. They want to get close to the fire. You know. So, if somebody like helps me to get close to the fire by sort of doing something shocking or something, whatever. I mean, maybe that's a gift to me in some in some place in my life. I do though think that. Well, when I kind of consult with my vision of things, I think, well, no, that's not it eventually. Eventually, we're, eventually we are, we're very close to it now. I don't need your dead rat. Like, <laughs> and you don't need to send it to me. Like, you're closer to it than you think, you know? Mm-hmm. And in fact, when we do that, we can be more, we can be more courageous and we can be more healthy, you know? Because... Right. We were just talking about, you know, people that are older, what you learn about life and how you can, you know, you can imagine more things because you've lived more. But man, the greatest actors are like kids that just, they turn it on on a dime, you know? I mean, they go, they go on a dime and they're right back out of it, right? Yeah. How the hell well, do kids, they do that? Kids are uninhibited. Okay. They don't have the walls. Okay. Yeah, they don't okay. have the walls. Okay. And I think, I think maybe to, 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 the, to the point I was saying is I think as you... As you grow older, you start to build walls, but then, which prohibits you from just really letting go and just kind of existing. So you fake it. But as you kind of relearn tragedy and Mm. and happiness and whatever else, and you can easily access it, then it kind of helps you break down those walls again, Mm. because you've got a tool set that you didn't have before, but a child has no walls and an open tool set. And they just kind of go and they don't, they don't worry about whether they're right or wrong. no real disappointment yet. Exactly. So they just, (laughs) they have, they have an uninhibited freedom that you don't have as an adult. (laughs) Depends on the child's experience though, mind you. It's true. There's, there's children who know way more loss than me, but yeah, it's interesting, interesting question because I don't know. Then you start to think like, well, hey, the walls are, that's part of life too. I mean, Mm -hmm. why, you know, why do we have to reveal? I kind of see what you're getting at though. Like the idea of if someone did do something and aggressed upon you and you are the type of person that that happens instantly, your walls are going to go up. That's not going to be good for working with that person. But I think it depends on the actor. It depends on the person. Yeah, that's right. It does. Totally. Hmm. Is there a, is there a role that you for stage specifically? Is there a role that you want to play that you haven't had the opportunity to play yet? There's a bunch of them, of course. Yeah, yeah. Just throw out one or two. Wish of them. list. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Hamlet's a good part. Biff's mm. a good part. 
Tom, Glass Magic, Skip Park. Um, what is it about those roles specifically that you find makes them a good part to play? Um, I'm trying to get to the heart of, of, of who you are as a performer yeah. and what it is your what it is lights your fire. So if these are the types of characters that you li- you would like to play, what is it about those characters that you find appealing and and would make you want to to pursue playing them? Well, um let's see. I mean just riffing to like find something sort of common between just those three, right? Let's talk in those three. Um I think that it's it's something to do with um they all they all confront uh, very difficult universal truths i think they all um or maybe it's just one universal truth i don't know that and I mean, to make this really armchair philosopher, you know, um, I think it's something like, uh, uh, that we're all pretty blind in this life, (laughs) you know, and, uh, there's, and there's, and though, yeah, the only way out of it is is this unknown. Uh, but to make it to make it a little more specific, I think what all three do is they keep it. They keep this truth in front of them. They like wrench it back when it when it wants to wander away. They're like, no. What are we doing here, really? You know. Mm-hmm. I think, I think that's, that's right. I mean, I mean, it's, it's then through, it's through specific circumstances, right? And, and it's through kind of specific things that we know of life or a lot of us know of life, you know, um, that, you know, that, that, uh, that like your dad your dad should see you, you know, he should Mm -hmm. see you. Right. Uh, and you know, Biff Loman demands that he finally demands that. It's like, uh, and that's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's the the heroism of it, or maybe it's like the, because of what it costs or because of what it, you know. Well, it sounds like it's, it's the characters that are struggling to find that truth that appeals to you. You know, you're talking about wrenching it and, yeah, and pulling I guess. it out. Yeah. Like, th- those are characters that have to really struggle to find that truth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are just the ones that came up with on, like on demand. Yeah, but yeah. you know, the, it's telling yeah, no, that those know, are the I three know. that pop up. You I know? know. Magic I know. hero at heart. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But, but I, yeah, there's, there's characters too, though, that I, that I, that I played, I played one of these in, in acting school it was, you know, in this Gorky play, this Maxim Gorky play. And he was, he was like the guy who, he had it figured out. You know, actually he had it. It was like a character in a play where it's like, no, he's just, he's just there. He just knows it. And it's like light just shines from him. Mm-hmm. And that was so much fun to do. Uh, I was the, the, the Philistines, Philistines, how do you say it? Um, but this was, you know, yeah, he, he sort of saw through the bullshit and he, uh, he insisted other people see through the bullshit, but not in like a mean way. Hmm. It was more in a way of like, eh, if you don't see it, you don't see it, man. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> because he and sees I, it and yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, great, he's got it down. Yeah, so. yeah. I had a, gr- a great time doing that one. Well, getting to a character like like Victor Fryce, um, 
do you see that character as a villain or do you see that character as a tragic hero that couldn't achieve what he was trying to achieve? Um, well, um, this is a delightfully okay. complicated story it is. between him and Nora. Oh, it is. It is. Certainly. I think that once she's dead, you know, and she's beyond repair. Now, in some stories, he's still sort of trying to get her back. Like mm-hmm. in some of the backstories and some, but I think in ours in Gotham, or as far as I understand it so far, like there's not any hope for that. He's actually now. Now he's a man gosh, without I don't hope. Know what he? I mean, yes, he's he's he's. Um, well, gosh, I mean, you try to end it and you change into something. That's what happens, right? He, mm-hmm. he then changes into something. I I think that he's going to kind of the next thing, which is, you know, there's some people who get so heartbroken that all that's left for them is the pain of others. Misery loves company sort of situation. Uh, right. Yeah, right. Um, the only thing that can amuse me or can divert me is to, you know... Just kind of try to try to go dead, try to try to, you know, but story still being told. I mean, mm-hmm. we could find out that there's a, we could find out that it's burning even brighter in there. You know, who knows? Tell somebody. When you think of coming back to that character, because um, I I find I, I'm a huge fan of you know, comics and specifically as superheroes and supervillains, um, coming back to a character like that, who now is without hope, how do you find something new to bring to a character like that going forward? Like where, where do you come from? I mean, obviously the the initial thing is the struggle to try and take care of somebody, but if he's without hope now, how do you as an actor find, well, a creative I, way to approach well, that. I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I think it's already interesting enough because I, I mean, I've I mean, already it starts to make me think. Well, have I ever been without hope? And mm. for how long was that? Something got me out of it because I would say right now, as a person, that I I do have hope or I have access to hope. Mm-hmm. But that's good enough. I mean, that's enough. That's a, that's a big circumstance to try to like start to crawl inside of. And, uh, I mean, what is the person without hope? Well, and there's a great question in that. Like, even whenever you are absolutely hopeless, the persistence of hope is there like a tiny, you know, right. Or, or at least, or even, or even it's absence. Like what, uh, you know, if there's no hope, maybe there's pleasure. Hmm. Maybe there's pleasure somewhere. Let's find pleasure in pain. Maybe, yeah. Pleasure in pain, pleasure in my own pain, pleasure in somebody else's pain, or just, or just maybe a pleasure that I haven't uh, investigated yet. Hmm. You know, uh, I mean, some would say like to be without hope is, you know, that's the most fruitful. That's the most. That's the best. There's freedom there. Right. Yeah. I mean, talk about like walls coming down. If you don't. If you're not hoping for anything, there's exactly. no, there's no restrictions to what you're doing. Right. right. Like just it's limitless possibilities. And, right. And you can maybe find out like what you are essentially mm. elementally. Maybe. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing and fun view. Of that. <laughs> How much fun are you having playing this character? It's this, no, it's it's good. It's good. Even um, even I remember the last thing we shot. Uh, you know, it was like this fight with uh, Firefly. You know, it was uh, I mean that that's what I was interested. I was like, well, what's what's the fun when you don't have hope or when you don't have right find out 
So what there's always you something to look at. You know, you're still upright. You're still breathing. You're still, can I still, what can I still do? So Simple. in that instance specifically, what did Mr. Freeze find fun in fighting a firefly? Um, well, I found her very attractive. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and that seemed, uh, I don't know, um, that seemed logical. Okay. Yeah. How did you feel when they showed you what your costume was going to look like with the transformation? Oh, man. Uh, Cause it's it's I thought well, it was incredible. It's pretty yeah. radical transformation yeah, yeah, for yeah. Your, yeah for the character. No, I mean especially the the kind of makeup and the the eyes. Yeah, it was really, stunning. Yeah, really interesting. No, I thought it was cool. And um, once once we got it all on, and I mean they did an amazing job. You know the the wig they made, the all that stuff, and 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 the care with which they they kind of do everything on that show is is really. It's really inspiring, and you know, how long does it take to do the the makeup? <laughs> yeah, I forget when I forget what it was, but I mean, I think I was like not a whole lot, but I think it was like two hours maybe in the mm-hmm. in the chair. It's a That's decent so amount of time yeah, in the, the chair. chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how uh, how comfortable is the suit? Like, I, I wanted to ask somebody on one of these shows that for a while. Because some some of the suits and and Mr. Freeze's suit looks bulky and it is, yeah, a little it awkward. Is, it is. Uh, it's okay. I mean, I don't have you know they they made it they really made it pretty well. I mean, it's not it's not too hot. It doesn't. It's not too cold. Um, <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, right? <laughs> um, let's see. There's a whole backpack thing that. I do remember a few times being like, geez, can we take this off? I mean, how much time do we have to like take this off? And that like ease things. Mm-hmm. And you can't, you just can't. It's mostly what's uncomfortable about it is the like you become very dependent. <laughs> you know. <laughs> can't feed yourself. Right. You can't know. like drink the water or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I was actually watching uh, the special features on captain america civil war uh-huh. and um some of the guys were talking about their suits they're like yeah every every film it just gets a little bit easier i can actually <laughs> feed myself this time yeah <laughs> yeah like, they get a little bit better each time yeah i mean that can be nice too you know you you get a lot of attention oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's fun so do you have uh, any projects like in the works right now any, anything big on the horizon um yeah, there are there are a couple. Um about a year ago I, I shot this uh movie for HBO about Bernie Madoff. Um uh, and, uh De Niro's playing Madoff and Barry Levinson directed it. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's playing uh Ruth and, oh, wow. and I played I play the younger son, Andrew. Uh it was just it was a blast to work on. Um, it's quite the cast. I know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really cool. And so that'll be coming out. I don't know when, but um, uh, that's interesting. And uh, I just worked on uh, the the final season of Rectify, which is a show on the Sundance Channel. Uh, it's in its 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 fourth and final season. Uh, uh, Ray McKinnon is is kind of the the writer behind it, um, and it's really really fantastic show, and uh, it's just a, it's a nice nice character, and you know. What is the premise happy... of that show? So um, it's about um, a young man goes to death row for a terrible, uh, I think, rape and murder. Uh, and then he is sort of half exonerated. His his sentence is vacated, and he comes back home. And uh, it's sort of about him kind of adjusting back home. And and along with that, it's sort of all the resentments and secrets within this family, and all the disappointments. Um, and his sister is very like involved in his life. Um, 
And so I play somebody that uh, knew his sister from school mm-hmm. who kind of re- reconnects with her. Um, it's, it's neat. It's really good. And um, You're doing a lot of film and television work. Yeah. Um, you uh, hoping to get back to the stage sometime soon, or Always. you you good on the trajectory no, that you're at um, right now? Well, I mean, good. Uh, sure, I'm I'm okay, but uh, no, I mean, I'm I'm uh, I would love to do a play. The last play I did was uh, almost a year ago. No, it was more than a year ago. Quite a bit more than a year ago. Um, I go in I go in for plays, you know, and uh, yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah, Thank you. It's been wonderful. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck. Telling you, please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching intellectual podcast with your ears are you enjoying the intellectual podcast and the intellectual talk show we'll show your support by becoming a patron at patreon simply visit patreon.com slash the intellectual and you'll have the opportunity to pledge uh, per episode of the Intellectual Talk Show. That'll get you exclusive access to ad-free versions of the show, early access to the show before it airs online or on television, either one, and um, some additional perks, uh, like being able to submit questions for future guests. It's a great opportunity to show your support and become an intellectual part of the Intellectual Podcast and the Intellectual Talk Show. Simply go to patreon.com slash the intellectual and show your support today for what we're doing here at the intellectual. Thanks.